why don't we go around first and make sure that everybody knows everyone. So uh, my name is Gwendolyn Reese. I am in the library. I'm the Director of Research, Teaching, and Learning and the Associate University Librarian. And I'm also uh, running a faculty learning community that is basically on this topic through CTRL this year. So um, I'm really happy to be here. Do you want to go ahead next? Hi everyone, I'm Cassandra. I'm a grad student and I also work with CTRL as a research consultant. I'm Sarah Dumont, I'm executive director of Taylor Broad. Mm -hmm. I'm Olivia Ivey, I'm the public affairs librarian and I also work with our AU Scholars Program for the Broadway Living Community. Anne-Marie Regan, I'm an adjunct faculty member with um, School of Public Affairs, teaching in the I'm Joseph Portani, interim faculty at COGA. I teach graduate undergraduate courses in information systems. Great, we're just doing introductions. Hi, I'm Gihan Fernando, and I'm executive director of the Indian Korea Center. Wonderful. So um, thank you all so much. Part of the reason that we were doing that is that this is mostly going to be a discussion, um, but I wanted to give a little bit of some background, like some scene setting, and then we'll mostly do discussions. And I'm, like I said, I'm really grateful to all of you for being here because I think this is an incredibly important topic that we are not adequately giving attention to. Um, so. First of all, I wanted to do a quick disclaimer, and that is that there are many positive aspects in, um, about our current information ecosystem, and another topic could be to look at how we could really maximize our utilization of them, but I really think that we need to spend some time seriously grappling with the more problematic aspects of our contemporary information ecosystem. And so what I want to do quickly, and this is a very rapid summary, <laughs> is I want to do a quick like historical overview that hopefully will give a little bit of context to at least how I see this problem. So for those of us who are, I'm, I'm about to be 50, so it, I'm one of the younger people who would have had the, the older model of kind of going through um, developing kind of an unconscious model of what good information looks like. And that old model basically was this. It's if you were given an assignment or you needed to find something out, I, um, more or less what you would do is you would have to go to a library. And you would go to the library because the library was the place where the information was. And you would be doing your research on whatever your topic was and you would be reading whatever the information was and you would be learning about your topic, but what you were also doing, and you probably were not consciously aware that you were doing it, is developing and building an unconscious model of this is what good information looks like. Now the part that we know as librarians, and Olivia and I are both here from the library, is that there was a tremendous amount of very high level intellectual labor going on behind the scenes, creating that collection and curating that segment of knowledge that was like this scaffolded thing that people were interacting with and developing this model of this is what good information looks like, which like I said, one of the main things here is that this is largely unconscious, right? So then what happened is what I'm calling the middle ground, the internet's wild, wild west period. And this would be after you have Netflix and a lot of the um, kind of, uh, you could get access to a lot more knowledge, not everything, but through the internet in this kind of unmediated fashion. And that had this kind of feeling of epistemological flatness, where things were kind of the same. And so you had a period in there in which people were developing their cognitive models that was really far more flat and not mediated, particularly. And that's where a lot of people kind of think of where we are, but that's not actually where we are anymore. And I guess that's part of what I want to address here, where we are now in terms of like our, the students that are coming to us now, they have this different model in terms of it is not epistemologically flat. What we have is that their unconscious model of what good information looks like is created largely through their interactions through proprietary search algorithms, 
things like the personalized web. There are ontologies behind this now. And I think that's part of what I wanted to bring to bear. There's ontologies behind how their information is accessed and structured that are not readily apparent. Um, and you know, like there's a lot of this is happening through machine learning and so forth. So as a quick kind of problematic aspects <laughs> of what I see of our current information ecosystem, some highlights. So most people now, including me, including everyone, you know, we go to Google, we go to various search engines, and we get our information. And these are created through these proprietary search algorithms, and they are frequently based on personalized history in some way of like what it is that you've looked at before and you seem to have reacted to. That is going to feed into these algorithms of what it is going to show you next time, right? So part of this is there's a lack of transparency. We don't really know how any of these search algorithms work. These are heavily guarded proprietary company secrets. We don't really know what Google is prioritizing over something else. Like I said, there are ontologies based in here that we don't know what they are. Um, we don't know how things are weighted. In addition to that, and I'm just going to point this out, I mean, library databases like our new uh, system also have some black box search algorithm things there. We don't really know how any of the uh, relevancy ranking works. So, you know, what is getting filtered in, what is getting filtered out? It's not clear. A lot of it is based on machine learning. And part of the issue there is that when we're dealing with machine learning, um, it's learning from something and it's learning from us. And that means that all of our biases that we have, that's part of what they're learning too. But it gives it this kind of um, sense of objectivity, you know, that it's coming through, that it's not based on humans, but actually everything that it is learning from originally comes from humans. And so I have some concerns about that in terms of you know, what all is being hidden in there that we're not aware of. Um, also, this challenge that we have with personalized information feeding into part of this. We're dealing with the attention economy is really what this is. You know, so attention is the main thing. And like I said, what they are, a lot of these machine learning kind of algorithms, they are showing you things that are like what you have liked before. And if you build a unconscious cognitive model of what good information looks like through your experiences of dealing with information and what you're constantly being shown is similar to what you have liked before, that is the definition of confirmation bias. And you know that is baked into these systems and our interactions with information in ways that are subtle and that, again, we're not necessarily aware of. So part of what I am perceiving is a lot of times when our students come to us, this is the, the kind of system that they've been brewing in. And they don't recognize that it's there and it's unconscious. And so when they come to us, they have some of this sort of um, confirmation bias really baked in. And again, a lot of the kind of um, skills of interacting and analyzing information, it's being fed to them through these various algorithms when we don't know how they're working. Okay, so that's one big piece. Another one um, is that the kind of information ecosystem that we're currently at, again, this is the attention economy. And most of the products are built for continuous, shallow engagement. And what we don't know, and we just do not know right now, we don't fully understand what this is doing to our ability to willfully direct and maintain attention. In other words, concentration and things of that nature. And anyone who has ever done or studied meditation knows this is very difficult for human beings under the best of circumstances. And this kind of continuous shallow engagement is something that we have some indications is detrimental to our ability for deep thinking. And this focused attention we know is necessary for critical thinking. So, you know, we're developing mental habits that run counter to deep critical thinking and deep contemplation. 
It also seems to be negatively impactful on the development of empathy. There's, um, a, I've got a number of different works on this, uh, on this particular bibliography, but one of them that I find very interesting that I would highly recommend for people is um, the one that is about deep reading and the way in which our continuous shallow engagement is undermining our ability to engage with reading in a deep way. And that's uh, the final one there, Reader Come Home. And there's a fair amount of indication that deep reading where you lose yourself, and this is like in fiction, when you lose yourself in a work of fiction that you are reading, and you are identifying with a character that you're experiencing certain things that you are not directly experiencing, but it seems to be foundational for the development of empathy. So again, we just don't know what all this is doing. Um, and in all areas, there are huge privacy and data security concerns that are often masked. They're just not obvious. And they're not something that most of our students tend to think about. And the final one that I just want to bring up is that we are dealing with a situation of rampant misinformation that goes far beyond just fake news. Um, in addition to that, it comes with this devaluation of expertise. You know, so um, if things are published and can be published by anyone, there is the situation and uh, so much of like the way in which we get our um, information has to do with like how many people have liked something. Again, that's, that's devaluing expertise in a certain way. It's kind of baked into some of these systems. Again, the confirmation bias is a problem. Uh, there's a lot of discovery of information through peers, which can feed into confirmation bias and feed into this devaluation of expertise. And we have some really, really savvy bad actors that know how to manipulate people. So those are, to me, the three major areas of really severe kind of um, challenges coming out of our information ecosystem. And so when we're looking at this in terms of the pedagogical implications, first of all, you know, we're swimming against the tide here. And I think that's something for us to recognize in that we are all immersed in our information ecosystem. And like I said, there's a lot of good things about it too, but telling people to be Luddites is not a viable solution to this. Telling people just delete your social media accounts is not a viable solution. So, we are in a situation as pedagogues attempting to address something in which the vast, 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 overwhelming majority of people's experiences is going to be in this system, not in what we do in the classroom, and not in what we do in the library, and not in what we do in assignments. So how then can we have an impact? And I think that's something I'd really like to explore with you all. Also, I. Um, as I talk to some of my faculty colleagues who, you know, I have been hearing over the years that they're getting more sources that are not appropriate in their papers and they, many of them have uh, begun to say, just use peer review. I only want to see peer review. Well, on the one hand, I understand that. And on the other hand, that can't be the substitute for training students in how to evaluate information because what's going to realistically happen is they're going to leave the university and most of those peer-reviewed articles are going to be behind paywalls that they won't have access to anymore. So, you know, to me, part of what we need to be doing, and it's only responsible for us to do this, is to try to figure out again, how do we help them really develop the critical thinking skills about information? Um, and finally, we need to find ways to explicitly teach, uh, teach about information, I believe. And like I said, you know, we have good integration in many ways of the library coming in and doing a session, what a session is not going to counteract all of that socialization, all of that um, you know, experience. So we have this challenge where we need this to be something that's deeply embedded into the class and into all of their experience uh, as long as they're in an educational institution. But as we know, time is always limited. So you know, there's this dual competing thing and you have to get them to have uh, mastery of certain kinds of domain knowledge. But how do you also then deal with this other issue? Uh, you know, understanding what good information is. So that is my scene setting to this challenge. <laughs> and what I'd really like to do now is to brainstorm some strategies. And what I'm going to do is um, I should send around actually something so I can get emails. I will capture what we come up with and send it back out to people. So if I can 
to send that around. But does anyone have any immediate thoughts of things they are doing or not doing um, that are working? Anything? I know you have one. Do you want to start? Sure. So um, I've been teaching at Kogut for five years and I did a couple of different things before that. Um, and one of the things that I found is that uh, there's a general lack of what I'm going to call critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And so um, we were talking about this before most of you got here. But basically what I do is the first day of all my classes, I teach two, dis two distinct but complementary things. I teach my students, I call it the pyramid of knowledge. But basically I, dist I, I distinguish between types of knowledge that are absolutely true, like laws of physics, right? The law of gravity is forces mass not deceleration. If I let go of this, it will fall to the ground. And then I talk about, so I talk about there are things that you can know that describe the how the world works, but doesn't tell you how you should behave. So the law of gravity says, doesn't say, oh, by the way, don't climb out this window, because if you fall, you'll get hurt. So what I tell my students is there's some of the things that we're going to cover, but we cover some business concepts, Moore's Law, there's a, there's a few other laws that, mm -hmm. if they're not absolutely true, they're pretty close to it. And then I talk about, we, and below that there are rules. Rules describe behavior. Rules tell you what you should or shouldn't do. And the rules of business change a lot. So folks like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and a few other people, they broke the rules of business. And I'm not talking about legal things, like Google, for example. They give their search engine away for free. Well, we didn't have the internet 30 years ago, but if somebody said, hey, I'm starting a business, I'm gonna give my product away for free, people would say, you're crazy, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. And then I talk about how these things are based upon your experiences, mm -hmm. and then I talk about how opinions and feelings. So I distinguish between the fact that we all have opinions about things for which we have experience, but we also have opinions for things for which we have no experience. The example I've been using for the last year is I'll say something like, uh, you could ask me my opinion about the ongoing civil war in Syria. I could give you one. I don't. But I, I haven't been there. I have only a very cursory understanding of it. So the fact that we're all entitled to our opinions does not mean that they're all of equal value. Mm -hmm. And then I finish up by saying, you've heard this before, it's a fact we all have feelings. Not all our feelings are facts. I feel like the earth is flat, you do too. So that's the introduction. Basically what I'm going to do is I'm telling them, whether it's me or it's them but somebody else, I think you need to put it through a filter of, is this something that's telling me how the world works? Not a judgment value, just saying, this is how things work. Is this is someone telling me how I should behave? And what is it based on? Because I tell my students, at least my undergrads, the almost, well pretty much all of them are going to work for someone who's going to be considerably older than they are. And then you hear something like, listen, I've been doing this longer than you've been alive. Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean they're right. It doesn't mean they're wrong either. So you have to make a distinction. And then from there I transition, I teach them the difference between science, faith, and hope in decision making. And I talk about how in the ideal world, I, I teach some analytics classes. We would have all the data, it would be on time, and we'd make all these data-driven decisions, and it sounds really, really it's, it's great, it almost sounds seductive. Hey, I'll never mess up by going with some gut or biased feeling if I use the data. And then I talk about practical implications of the fact that uh, if you're an entrepreneur and you're gonna do something nobody's done before and your boss says, hey, I wanna see all the data that's gonna tell us it's gonna work. Well, that's not gonna work. It's kinda like railroad tracks only take you, where the train can go where the tracks are. So that's my first day that's my first day of every class I've taught for about eight years now. Mm -hmm. So you're helping them have an understanding of different types of knowledge. Do you then uh, integrate that into the way in which like you give a reading assignment? Um, do you bring that into like that framework into helping them understand not just the topic but like the information itself? Or? Right, so that's where the thing is, is that again, I, I use this concept of laws and I do not mean in the legal sense. Yeah. I mean in the sense of knowledge. And the things that we say are laws, they're not absolutely true laws of physics, but they're pretty close. And what I tell students is that one of the things you have to be really careful of is if imagine this period, a pyramid, 
is that down here someone says, well, I've been doing this for 20 years, and my experience is the law. I'm telling you that's how the world works. Even though they may be smarter, more educated, I tell them they're almost certainly going to be wrong, and you have to be really careful about somebody saying that my experience is how the world works. So, okay. Yeah. I wasn't, I was trying to find something, an article um, that I can't find. I think I put it into you behind this by Jill LaFour. She's an historian at Harvard, and mm -hmm. she writes a lot for the New Yorker. And she was writing something uh, kind of in, in the context of everything that's going on with Facebook and the mm -hmm. privacy um, things and, and what's going on with Google and all, all, of, all of this stuff. And she was making a case for the importance of a liberal arts education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By saying that, okay, you have people like Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs, you know, yeah, they, they, they dropped out of college or didn't go to college. And there is this idea out there in our culture that going to college is a waste of time. You don't need to because look at Zuckerberg, look at mm -hmm. Steve Jobs, all those things. And she said, yes, you have people running these new technology kind of things. And, you know, you've got Uber and, and Airbnb and all of these guys. And they're very smart, mm -hmm. and they're very technologically apt and skilled, but they're not educated. And they therefore think that anything they create in terms of this technology is, by its very nature, a good thing. Mm -hmm. That all they're doing is something good. They're making knowledge available. They're making things available. It's all, it's all good. And the more they do it, the better life will be. And because they don't have any real understanding of history, of mm -hmm. human behavior, of all of these things that ideally you get out of a good liberal arts education, this notion that you can create something good and an evil actor can use it for bad. Mm -hmm. um, that things are not in and of themselves good, that it's mm -hmm. human behavior and how humans behave when we have historical evidence for what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and she said that's that's the, where all of this comes from, that the problem is that these people are not educated. So they may be smart and they may be very skillful, but they're not educated. And it's important to have the education so that you can evaluate, that you can uh, project into the future, you can protect against. I mean, I look at what happened with Facebook and think, what on earth did people think was going to happen with this? Right. You know, it just makes perfect sense to me that this is what happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why didn't they see it coming? Because I could have seen it coming, but I'm a technological idiot, so no one listens to me. You know, yes, I am something of a luddite, but I look at that and think, of course that happened. Mm -hmm. And everyone else is so surprised. So I think, I think in a way, by its very nature, what we do here, if we continue to really do it and stick to the importance of giving students a true liberal education and an understanding of history and of human psychology and of philosophy and all of these things that the new core is even trying to do, mm -hmm. I think if we do that, that, that will go a long way. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm feeling optimistic. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. I guess um, I'm going to push back a little bit in that I think you're right, except I'm going to say that I think we hear from faculty in all those areas that they're getting papers that demonstrate that this is not happening to the level we need it to. Yeah, and then that it has to do with this. Well, but what, what we're all afraid to do, yeah. this, this is the problem for the institution, what we're afraid to do is then push back on the students and give them a bad grade when they don't do what we told them to do. You know, the students have That's to the be, there has to be some, some rigor in how we do this, and we yeah. have to be prepared. You know, there, there's we live in a culture of instant gratification, and that is also part of yeah. what teachers want this business of you don't move on in the class until you think everybody's got it. Well, psychologists have done plenty of studies to show that actually, if you make learning harder for students, yeah. they'll learn more and they'll remember it better. But if you make it easy, all very linear, give them all of the tests right there, they all get it right, well, they're just going to forget it. You, you make it, you divide it up, you make it hard for them to learn, you make them struggle to learn, you confuse them. You give them a bad grade at the start and say, you can make as many mistakes in the beginning as you want, I'm going to grade you on it, but don't worry, because if you're performing well at the end, that means you actually have learned it, if you teach it that way. But we don't teach that way in this country, let alone at this institution. And I see that as a problem, because what we're doing is we're, we're afraid to push back at the students and I wouldn't use the word punishment, but you do have to direct them, and that means telling them that they're wrong, telling them they've done it wrong, and, and make them go back and do it again. So, yeah, so also then this uh, this importance of the scaffolding. Yeah. 
And the importance of struggle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? I have a quick story. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I, I have a quick story that I was just mm-hmm. at another university. I was teaching an MBA course. And I had a student who already had his master's in finance, so he's already already has a master's. And he wrote a paper, and in it there was a citation that American Airlines was the most profitable U.S. airline. This was about five or six years ago when American it was either they were in bankruptcy or they had just emerged from bankruptcy. So my comment on the side of the paper was, okay, th- this cannot be true. You you can't be bankrupt and the most profitable. It's through, it's oxymoron. So he came to me and when we met for class and he said, I can show you my citation of where I got it. And I said, I'm not disputing that. I'm not saying like you made it up. I'm just saying it's wrong. And he said, you can't hold me accountable for my sources. And I said, yes, I can. And yes, I will. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, again, a teaching business context. But if you get up and say something and you present to some of your boss executive customers yeah. and they say, that's, that's <coughs> not correct. You can't say, well, I found it someplace, and therefore you can't hold me responsible. So this wasn't somebody who was 19 years old, he's probably in his late 20s, already had a master's degree, and arguing with me about, you, you can't penalize me for my research because I can show you what I got it. Mm-hmm. I think the problem that you are raising in the whole session and in your nice you know, discuss, you know the, the background piece that you spoke mm-hmm. with us about, I think the problem is it's like way too late by the time they get here, right? It feels to me like with this new ecosystem that we're talking about in which everybody is growing up, it's like reading and writing. It's it's sort of the you know, it needs to start with when you're learning how you apply admission, right? In a in the most basic way. It's it's um, you know, they have been trained from the time Literally, from the time that they were starting out to be interacting with the world, right? From mm-hmm. when you're learning to speak and to read yeah. and, uh, and so on. It, it's grade school, it's really, you know, and so I, I, mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure what the answer is there, I'm just sort of throw up my hands, you know, but, uh, uh, and also both of what you said touch on this idea of, uh, so I, I'm in the in the career center, as I said, and one of the things we see employers wanting as a sort of a macro skill is is the kind of skills that comes from a broader liberal education, mm-hmm. right? And liberal arts specifically. Um, and so critical thinking, you mentioned this and you invited Sarah. But I think that that's really what we're getting at. It's yeah. kind of like where do you get your information? How do you think about the information, and does it make sense? Mm-hmm. Right? Is yeah. it, um, and being able to read in that way, as opposed to in this very quick, fast. Well, what do we yeah. do about this? This almost. I just I want to make one quick yeah. comment to that, and that is that information literacy from our field is a subset of critical thinking. Right. That's their. Um, it's a part of that. Part of the challenge that I see in institutions of higher ed, including ours, as an example, is that information literacy as this very critical subset of thinking tends to live in non-credit bearing, non-course bearing parts of the institution or the library, and we often have a challenge then in ensuring that this is adequately systematically integrated into the curriculum. Yeah. I mean, it's related to that, I mean, to say what 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 can we do here about this almost rarefied view that exists in this country and other places too about crowdsourcing your information? Mm-hmm. And that enough people believe it, it's got to be true. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the entire this is the whole problem with something like Wikipedia, with like Google, is that you know, okay, if enough people say that's what it is, then that's what it is. And and that isn't true at all. Um, and I, I, I don't know whether we could do something to give students the kind of experience I had as a graduate student before the internet existed, um, which you guys know I'm going to love because it, it taught me the importance of librarians and of curation of information. Mm-hmm. If I was doing my graduate thesis on on the German song of, of uh, early 17th century, mm-hmm. and, and I was I was going to write about the, the relationship between poetry and music. And I knew a lot about music, because I was a music historian. I didn't know anything about poetry yeah. at that time. So 
Uh, I was at Oxford University of England, and there's a whole separate library for languages. Yeah, wonderful library, the Tenorian. So I go in there to learn, to get lots of books, and start learning about German poetry from the Middle Ages on into the 17th century. And not knowing where to start, I went to the German librarian and said, can you recommend to me what to do? And she said, oh, yeah, this is fascinating stuff. Not many people look at it, and you have to be really careful, she said. Um, so I'm going to give you a lot of books, but I'm going to tell you some stuff about them so you can be careful how you read them. Right. Because she said a lot of work was done on the poetry of your period um, in the early days of the German universities during this, in the 1920s and 30s. Mm, yeah. And she said it's fabulous work, it's really well done historically, but she said what do you think is going on in Germany in the 20s and 30s? It's all this stuff about West German Volk and about the supremacy of German culture, and she said it has a philosophical standpoint, and the whole point of these books was to prove the supremacy of this German poetry over every other poetry that exists in Europe and the rest of the world. So she said there's a lot of crackpot stuff in there. There's a lot of good stuff, and there's a lot of crackpot stuff. So she said, I'm going to give you these books. I'm going to tell you which authors to watch out for, and when you're confused, you come and talk to me, and I'll help you get through this stuff. And without her, Mm -hmm. I would have written a thesis full of rubbish, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it just taught me that when you don't know the historical context, when you don't know the history of this, you, you have no way of evaluating this information, even with, you know, my pre-existing degrees and a lot of experience doing research, I didn't know that field. Yeah. Um, and I don't know whether perhaps giving students assignments by deliberately putting them in the path of crackpot stuff is out there. Mm -hmm. Then showing them how crackpot it is. That how might make it less. That's, an That's interesting because idea. for me, this this you know here I'm talking about it 40 years later. You know it'll never leave me that experience, and that's why I freak out about Wikipedia because I keep remembering how easily it would have been for me to write a whole thesis full of rubbish. So that's a really interesting idea that I had not thought of. So possible creation of assignment in which you put students in the midst of crackpot stuff, yeah. and then explain why. And then after they've done it, after they've written their paper, then go back and say, okay, now I'm going to tell you what y'all did. That's actually a really, I bet that would make an, an impression. I mean, I know that back in the day, like one of the things that I used to show students was um, there's a terrible site. Actually, I haven't looked to see if it's still there. The the MLK site that's run by the Stormfront. Oh yeah, it's one of the top Google hits. Yeah. If you search for MLK, you get yeah, you get a that's run by a neo Nazi site. I mean, you know, but it's very hidden, and so like sending them that direction in order to like scare the hell out of them a little bit. So yeah, I I think maybe you know because I think in a way, you know, that would catch their attention. We're talking about attention. Stuff. Yeah, and. Let them let them go all the way into that crackpot stuff and come out thinking they've written a really great paper and then. Yeah. We take a slightly different approach and quite a little bit we're talking about this before um, before the session started. But um, the undergraduate course that I coordinate, one of her colleagues comes to class, and we give up a seventy-five minute period every mm -hmm. instructor does this mm -hmm. to talk about um, research beyond Google. Right. So, the, and, and this kind of gets does two things. First, it gets them away from I found it on the internet, so it must be true. Right? You can't put things on the internet that can't be true. Right? Everybody knows that. And then the other thing is that the uh, there are a whole series of databases and subscriptions yeah. and things that they're paying for anyway through their tuition. And so we do an in-class exercise where the business librarian walks them through specific things, and we tell them things like, generally speaking. In business, and I would say in academia, Wikipedia is not a good source unless you're talking about like dates, like when was this company founded, or something like that. But anything beyond that is considered to be a very weak source. And so we we do we don't do crackpot per se, but we tend to say things like these types of sources tend to be better, and they tend to have greater weight than things that are not. And just uh, and so Hannah just joined us. She is our education and specs librarian. Um, yeah, we do. Uh, I was just looking at it. We did 505 sessions like that last year. Um, all the librarians. So we are integrated into the curriculum. Like I said, one of the things in here is to be sure, given the changes in the curriculum, that we are really truly integrated in all the different places we should be. But I think you know, hopefully those are uh, those are helpful. But yeah, we do a lot of those. Um, 
Yeah, so I have a couple of thoughts. One um, in the nature of obstacles and one in the nature of brainstorming yeah. what to do. So I think in your introduction, you talked a little bit about the information environment that students had grown up in. Yep. And I want to sort of flag that um, that it's not just students, right? We've got faculty who have grown up in the digital age as well. Um, and just yeah. today, in an Ampharis session, I use this app in my class. Oh, it's free, right? And in my mind, I'm going, if you didn't pay with money, you're the product, right? You're, you are paying. Like, we don't read licensing agreements as right. faculty before we hand a, a free app to our students and say, you should use this too. Yeah. I need you to download this app on your phone to participate in my class. It's free, don't worry. Okay, so so privacy doing, concerns yeah. and security concerns, our faculty aren't thinking about No, they're not, that's true. Right, so how are we gonna teach our students to think about what we don't think about? So that's one thing I just wanted to flag. That's a really that, important point. That we, as faculty, get excited about what these technological tools can do for us and we don't think through the security implications, the data implications, what am I, you know, what am I agreeing to when I download this free app? And if I mandate that my students use that free app to participate in my class, what am I putting on them yeah. to agree to as currency for participation? Right? So so there are some of these skills that that we don't have <laughs> in the faculty. Um, and I think you know, I, I think there's yeah. a, you mentioned the core, that some of the new core, I think there's some opportunity for, I'd like to see the librarians more able to teach semester long courses with the core as a vehicle. Um, I know Amanda had developed an information overload complex problems class, but we, we sort of face this barrier of, you know, this isn't our, our core duties and so we would have to do it as adjuncts and who would pay us and so then it just sort of like this really great idea of an information overload class just sort of gets approved by a committee and then sits on the shelf with nobody teaching it because it's not our core responsibility and there's no money to make to, to have librarians as full-time instructors um and you know somebody asked me towards the end of the last year do you ever teach semester long courses I'd like for you to teach in my program? And, and you know, my answer initially was no, but then I spent the whole break dreaming about this course on information access and privilege. Yeah. And having students keep a log of, you know, partnering with DCPL as a community based learning class to have them learn about the digital divide and who doesn't get access to information and who does and have them mm -hmm. creating logs of you know i know there are faculty who will do like a 24 hour without your phone and then write a paper about it the students can't do it and their paper is about the panic attacks they got without their phone um but i think it would be more interesting instead of like forced separation from the from the but to actually keep a log of the information you you access throughout the day with various columns of what did it cost right and so that could mean a very deliberate like i paid a dollar for a newspaper but it could also be you know i was able to access this because my tuition paid for it right like i learned from my librarian that tuition paid for version or um i paid for it with my privacy right i paid for it um, and then a column for value, right? What value did you get out of accessing this information? And and sort of what, and, right? Isn't this fun, right? And then this idea of just sort of having, bringing, I like this idea of attention economy, right? So yeah. we we do all of this without attention. <laughs> I'm putting this, Olivia, get her to write this up. I know. <laughs> And then, like, I just I want to teach this class. And I want to teach it as a CV class because I want to incorporate the public library and the community and information. Like, I'm just so excited about this thing that will never happen. So that's that. Yeah, and I just like you said, these one-offs are they're great in a lot of ways. But I mean, I spend a lot of time teaching students in the School of Public Affairs why high online is awesome. And then maybe if they go on to political careers or careers in government offices that have these subscriptions, they can use it. Um, but it's also not an information literacy skill that will help them day to day, right? They're not going to read a law review article to make decisions in their personal lives. They're not going to read a law review article to understand, you know, how to be a good citizen navigating the city, right? 
Maybe you should, but they, I have more of these. But I, I, I want a little more. I want to get my hands into more sort of like practical life information literacy. Yeah, and that's not what the subject area library integration allows yeah. for me to do. It almost sounds like you could actually do corporate education, or, you know, taking this and actually doing the providing the course as a. I'll give them the consultant. No, I mean, so you said that, you know, who would pay for the adjunct, but I would think that it's it's desperately needed, not just with the rural person. And I mean, yeah, and I mean, I think the other challenge, just since I am uh, in Olivia's, I mean, one of her administrators, I think the other thing is, it's like, I think this is great. I had a similar thing of like, I was told, oh, if you really, I could develop a data ethics yes. course, because I'm like, you know, if there's something we need, in our data sciences program, because I'm also different hat chair of the IRB. It's like mm -hmm. we need data ethics training for every single person going through this, but we don't have a structure to to offer it. You know, nobody's going to develop those courses. They're like, well, you could. I'm like, when? <laughs> I mean, you know. So I think that's the other problem. It's like I we can't. First of all, I'm not in the right unit to do that because we're not a, a credit offering unit. But in addition to that, like when it's like I already have a fifty hour a week job. You know. Remember, so you know, there was that initiative a few years ago that everybody in these non academic in these academic units within academic affairs, but we're not quite bring we're supposed to have our staff all develop and offer courses to teach and, and do it, yeah, in their free time and for no additional pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and if everyone got all excited. Oh, it would be great to have all these staff they can teach. It'd be great for their experience. And I was the one who raised my, my little hand and said, "And I assume you're going to make them adjuncts, and they'll be paid for this, right?" And of course, that was a very unwelcome question. And I persisted, and learned kind of whole idea basically just went through because there there is there is no no money to pay for it, and yet yeah, it's not considered part of your. Yeah, and yeah, I, I think even if, even if you were to get, let's say, a class, right, as yeah. part of the it's 20 students, 20, 20, you know, that's 20 students, like we're not really a particular issue yeah. or in right the mix, unless it gets into the cores or the first year curriculum or something like that as a general. It should be part of AUX. Uh, yeah, it's exactly. so much in pile the day. It's like it's yeah, a, it's you know, because that's, that's, that's the attention economy, right? Like, how do you how do you make it something that's that has enough currency in the attention economy to make it mm -hmm. top line priority? Well, and you know, I think so. I'm going to put down the second one of my personal things that I wish would happen. Like, if I could force people into things, like I wish whenever faculty members had a classroom discussion about a reading. That they would set aside five minutes. It's like here we are. We're reading this thing on you know the um, psychological history coming out of 1940s, whatever, blah blah blah. Um, you know to say okay for five minutes out of this discussion about the content, why did I assign this to you and why is it good? And to like go through and have that just be something they do with every single reading. And because I think it would take some scaffolding at first, because I imagine if you were to go to a student and say, this article, why is it a good article? They'd be like, you know, not, not the content, not what does it say, but why is it in and of itself good? And have them start to think about that. I think that would be valuable. Thank you. With, with graduate students, the courses that I taught, I don't think any of them had a textbook. And there's been a lot of Harvard art cases and things like that. So. I always start off the discussion of whatever the reading was with, did anybody bother look to see who the authors are? Right. Yeah. Right. And and almost universally it's no. And so I say, so you're kind and of operating on assumptions. What's that? And date of publication. Yes. Yeah. Well, some stuff is on the older side, but it's still right. relevant. But again, it could be something that's older and it's been outdated. Yeah. But and in terms of habit building, right? Right. Yeah. And it, you need to get in the habit of, you know, not like, well, he wouldn't have asked us to read it if it wasn't right or important. And then I'll say something like, well, people at Harvard never make mistakes, right? Right. And they always get it right. With undergraduates, because we tend to use textbooks, we do, like when I talked about this law, we do things like Moore's Law, Christensen's Law, there's a few other named after people. And I will say something like, it, in some cases, there's still a lot of good. Christensen's still a lot of teachers at Harvard. And I'll say, who's Christensen? Did anybody bother to look who this person is? 
And right. why should we listen to Christmas? Now, he happens to have done a, a ton of research and was kind of seminal in that. But still, that gets to that critical thinking of mm -hmm. just because the instructor put it on the syllabus doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. And, and just as an aside, there were, we did a Harvard case study. Uh, this was about a year ago. And it was this technology implementation. It was an Excel spreadsheet. You had to build out this model. Mm -hmm. And it was all these inferences. And students came to me and said, some of this stuff is not covered in the case. And I said, of course it is. Right? It wouldn't get published, right? And then I went through the case, and stuff was missing. And I was finally able to track down the author. It was actually published through Michigan, I think. Anyway, they finally fixed it, but I had to go before the class and say, I fell into the trap, too. Some of the things it asked you to were missing. You, there were some like hourly rates and some costs and percentages and things like that. So that, that, that was unintentional, but that was a good example that even myself, I fell into the trap of, well, oh, it's got to be in there. And it wasn't. So analyzing a flawed piece, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was, um, it was unintentional, but. Um, no, but you found it. You could use that. Yeah. Interesting. One of my former professors wrote an article uh, proving that a certain person had written certain pieces of music, not the composer anyone thought. Um, and it was based, you know, on a few like little tiny facts. He developed this whole argument, and he wrote it, and he got it published mm -hmm. um, in a journal. Um, and but but he did, um, you know, immediately write and say, I, I did this to show how you can make these arguments based on available information. And it all made perfect sense. It was just sure. the truth. Um, and I think, yeah, having those kinds of, you know, a flawed article. Um, which he admittedly is smart. He was going to tell the students at first, and then, yeah. and then you show how. Uh, I mean, something like that. It was it was really fascinating. This this professor had us all read it in the class, and then you know he showed us. I mean, we all kind of knew it couldn't really be true. It was basically <laughs> the the, the harpsichord composer Domenico Scarlatti, and he basically made this argument that actually Princess Maria Barbara wrote these sonatas, and he had all these. I mean, they were quite entertaining, like the fact that in the beginning. It's early so there's a lot of cross hands work, but in the later pieces, not. He said, Well, you know, she got fatter and fatter as she got older, so she couldn't cross her hands and play with cross hands because she was she was too fat to do it at the end of her life, so that explains why. <laughs> Has anybody seen any YouTube videos on flat earth? Yeah. I stumbled upon this, and there's, there's actually conferences, and people will talk about scientific proofs about how the earth is flat, and it's not. I mean, it's obviously not a big thing, but that might be something to say. Why don't you watch this video and listen to this person explain chapter and verse? Well, if the Earth was round, then why would I be? Able, why does this happen? And you, and you go through it, and I mean, it's these are it's it's not a spoof. Yeah. These are people that have confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the first time I saw this, I thought, oh, this is going to be a spoof. This is going to be somebody saying, ha ha, that's funny. And then there's people say, well, no. And then we did this experiment with Barbara Lizabee, and if the Earth was actually spinning, then the Coriolis effect. I'm thinking, well, what? What? Yeah. So that might be something, maybe an exercise. And like, you can be passionate and sincere, and you could be completely wrong. Mm -hmm. There was also years ago, and I kind of always wanted to do this, mostly because I admit to a certain amount of like. I used to be in uh, religion and philosophy. Postmodernists can drive me a bit bonkers at times. The, the postmodernist engine, did you ever see that one where they would generate? Um, it was like an automated engine and they would generate with footnotes and everything a postmodern essay. And it, was, it meant nothing. Yeah. I mean, it meant absolutely nothing. It was just jargony, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah, and it'd be kind of interesting to pull a few of those out that, that things still exist. Because you could come up with an interpretation of what that might mean. I think I think part of what we're getting at here is if we want students to pay attention to these issues, yeah. we have to make it kind of entertaining and fun for them to right. engage with the problem. And there are lots of ways to make this entertaining and fun, actually. Right. You know, the, the crackpot stuff, the flawed article, the flat earth people. I mean, you you can find examples that will catch their attention and and yet give them that experience of being punked a little bit 
and, and then they'll remember it. I think the other one is like, you know, should you decide to follow up on any of these readings, some of the stuff out there, we could assign like a chapter out of almost any of these books, like the algorithms of oppression. I mean, that at least to me is sufficiently terrifying that it also should, um, or something, you know, I mean, there's the ones that are on like um, the way in which these black box algorithms and machine learning learns from humans that they will always tell you. It's like, oh, well, you know, the African-American person going up for parole is more likely to have, you know, it's more likely to be a uh, recidiv um, recidivism, higher recidivism rate, and so you should deny them parole. But that's completely based on a historical situation of over-policing black people. Right. You know, but it looks objective. So, I mean, I think like some of those of these very real world kinds of, you know, examples also maybe, especially given our population, I think might be sufficiently jarring and upsetting enough that maybe that would stick some too. But there's a whole bunch of them on this list, by the way, that have some great stuff of that, of that nature. Um, the one, the toxic tech, um, the, which is the technically wrong um, and other threats of toxic tech. There's uh, the algorithms of oppression. There's a number of them in there that you could like grab a chapter. They're easily readable. I think one of the other challenge, by the way, when you're dealing with this particular topic area, um, as I was finding for the faculty learning group that I put together, which is we're looking at a fair number of these sources, is that this area is changing so rapidly that by the time good scholarship is done on it, it has moved three generations beyond that. So a lot of like, if you want to figure out what's going on, it almost has to be in the popular press. And that's another thing that has to do with this mismatch with how communication information is being created and the um, speed at which scholarship tends to, and the scholarly publishing tends to move is dramatically mismatched with the technological developments and the way in which things are flying, which that's a whole other issue. Kristen, what's the faculty group here? So um, through CTRL, there's a faculty learning community. Um, at this point, you know, if you are interested, um, let me know and we might be able to open it up. Is, is it sort of just a, um, is it around this topic? It's around it, this topic. Right, okay. I was gonna say, I, mean, I, I don't think I would join that group. Um, one of the reasons because I'm not faculty. But, um, yeah, it's through CTRL, yeah. But, but um, could this be one of CTRL's lunch and learn topics, perhaps through that faculty group? Yeah. But, you know, at least to propose it to Kiko as one of those. Because it strikes me as a topic that mm -hmm. could have wide interest to a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, and it's the kind of thing that even just planting it beyond sort of the couple of faculty members that are in this room, right. right, would be helpful. Yeah, and no, I would be happy to turn it into a lunch and learn. We're also hoping to have some, I don't know what the next steps will be. Um, I'm finding that the faculty learning community, while we have a few people, it's been difficult to get everyone convened and to have them read. I mean, everybody's right. just so busy. Right. And I think this is the problem, much like, you know, I wish we had yeah. more people here. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> But you no, know, I, I do think, you know, so I am like, again, I'm incredibly grateful to all of you because I think um, I want this to get out. Like the librarians are all on board and have been for a long time of like, we're in crisis, but you know, we're kind of like off to the side right. in certain kinds of conversations. So, okay, thank you. I will, I'll make sure that we do a lunch and learn because I think I probably need to do that as a teaching fellow anyway. Yeah. So, uh, to go back to one of yeah. like, like someone mentioned something about incorporating elements of this in AUX. Yeah. So I'm on the AUX2 Council, and I was able, as part of the learning objectives, to incorporate critical information literacy. Thank so you, Anna. For one of those weeks, That's we awesome. actually yeah, are actually talking about this. It's only one week, it's only one Wednesday, but I mean, I'm giving them a reading. It's stuff. something, and so I'm giving them a reading. So it, uh, an algorithm of oppression has to generate to the culture system. And yeah. We're talking about algorithm bias. Basically, um, understanding that technology is not neutral, there are biases and things, things yep. and that machine learning and um, artificial intelligence are actually amplifying these biases and yep. terror, terrifying these. Um, yeah. So there's one lesson in AOX2 so that all freshmen are going to take. Good. So at least it, we're getting a little something to consider into this. Yeah, well that's really good because then that could be built on. Thank you. Yeah, because then that could be built on. That's exactly, yeah, that's exactly what we need. One thing I did for a couple of years 
before I came here, but I was only teaching one class or two classes at a time, was I had, I did this with graduate students, is I gave them, it's an extract of Thomas Friedman's book, The, the World is Flat. Not, yeah. not, not this other not book. Not literally. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphorically, yeah. Flat. Yeah. And there was a, it was like a one or two page web page that basically summarized it. It's very, very easy to read. And I asked them a couple of questions. And then what I found was most of them talked about what they wanted to talk about. Yeah. And there were some questions about like logic. And uh, one of the things like with, with I teach some quantitative courses. I'm, I'm very sensitive to using um, gen, um, qualitative words like, hey, it's really expensive. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost a lot. It's saving a ton of money. Well, that doesn't have any meaning in, in, in context. Yeah. What, what's expensive to you and expensive to you. So I did that for a while, and I was, I, I either made it, it was worth like maybe 1% of the grade, and I was really hammered up on like grammar and like everything just to kind of set the tone of a very low. But the problem is that doesn't scale because there's it's 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 one paper per student, so you'd have to do like I have 130 students this semester. I have to do 130 papers on top of all the stuff I already do. So yeah, um, maybe I don't know. Maybe there's a way of I, I, that was something I did for a while. So um, how would I capture this for the brainstorm? Well, something like uh, give them an early low stakes assignment that gets to your expectations of, you know, when I ask you to do research or I ask you to do a citation or I ask you to answer a certain question, you know, how do you approach it? And what I find is, and I mention this to my students since I'm a lot older than pretty much all of them, is that I say something like, your generation was raised with a much stronger sense of how you feel about things. And that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad thing. Because we know that when you keep things inside, it leads to all kinds of bad, bad, bad things if you keep things bottled up. Right. Um, but what I tell my students is that um, you need, when you're asked a question, again, I, I'm in the domain of business, I understand it may be different for, for other folks is that. But you have to understand the the type of questions that you're being asked. So when I do my difference between science, faith, and hope, I tell my students that you'll always know where you are in the decision-making spectrum by the verb you use. And the way it is, it's I know, I think, I believe, I feel, I hope. They're all appropriate in business. And what I find is I'll do something like, um, so-and-so, why don't you tell us about the case study for today? I didn't like it. It was stupid. Okay. Fair enough, maybe you don't like it, and maybe it was stupid, but the question wasn't, I wasn't asking you an opinion question, I was asking you a definition question. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, this is gonna become important in business when someone says something like, well, what kind of project are you working on? When working on this project, it's really stupid. Okay, why don't you tell me what it is and what you're doing? And then if you wanna keep going and say, and I don't think it's the right direction for the business because it fails on these levels. That's actually a pretty good answer. So what I focus on students is I tell them something like, my pedagogical approach, at least with undergrads, is that I want you to be able to define something and then give me a definition. So if I say something like, what is the definition of a bird? I get something like, a bird is like an eagle. Well, all eagles are birds, but not all birds are eagles. Mm -hmm. But if you can define what a bird is or define whatever it is and then say, an example of a bird is this. So that's sort of how I bridge that, but I don't make it like, well, I guess I am going for it, but um, I don't make it like, I'm not inherently criticizing a generation of students right. because they were raised with a stronger sense of feeling. I'm right. just telling them, if, if I ask you a knowing question, I expect a knowing answer. If I ask you a feeling question, I'm expecting a feeling answer or somewhere appropriate in that spectrum of decision making. I'm not sure this is even just this generation. I mean, I've been taught for a long time, but when I did, and I would ask students to, you know, listen and study a piece of music and then write me an evaluation of that piece of music, I would get things like, um, this piece of music is bad because I didn't like it. Why didn't you like it? Because it was bad. Yeah. And you yes. go around and around and around like that, and they'd say, no, you're perfectly entitled not to like it. Tell me why you don't. Right. And not say because it's bad and it's bad because of I think there's things in there that you can like to analyze that and give me an answer. But it was always like playing to them. They, they couldn't seem different. This was at least two other generations prior to this one. Yeah. 
And I just put up there one of the things that I wish that we did, and I am rusty myself on this, but informal logic and logical fallacies. I mean, part of this I do think is that we don't teach people how to, to think. So you end up with that, it's like circular argument. I mean, and I was never officially taught that for all my background until I got really mad at a faculty member who was harassing female students in graduate school, learned them, and then just fought with them constantly. <laughs> <laughs> on that. That was like years of like 30 years ago now that I like made myself learn all the logical fallacies mostly because I was mad but you know <laughs> but it was really dead useful to be able to go through it's like and then out of that it was like I really like this and I learned how to do things like graph arguments and I mean I don't know when we do that if ever outside of a philosophy department. Students aren't taught in many cases how to actually write an essay that that's you know takes a point of view and argues it logically. Mm -hmm. um, they're not taught it in high school and, and and then they get to college and I think people assume that they know how to do that and they don't. And I think some faculty do do it and a lot go because in a lot of courses they don't have to write papers. Um, but it's it's a problem. I yeah. think teaching graphing arguments is dead useful. It is so useful because it, it makes you it's like graphing it's like you know, diagramming sentences, except you take the argument and you pull it out and you graph it. I mean, you can see where the, the weaknesses are. Yeah. We do a we do a team project in one of the courses I teach, and it's a it sounds very straightforward. They have to find analyze an emerging information technology, and then make a, a persuasive argument about why a business of their choosing should use it. It sounds very very straightforward, but the big difference is unlike everything else in the class is there's not a right answer. And for 19 and 20 years old, 20 year olds, solving an open-ended problem right. is really challenging. So I tell them, I tell my students is that our relationship is going to change throughout the semester from you're going to come to me because I have the answers, you're going to come to me because I have the questions. So when we do databases like how many customers in Maryland bought this product last Tuesday, there's only one right answer. Right. And then we move away from that. And we do teach them Again, in a very narrow context, we do teach them the argument, and we do do a team meeting with every at least one team meeting. And what I tell my students is, I know that grades are really, really important to you, okay? But if just for a moment, if you can just separate your grade that you earn from the things that you're learning on this project, how you come up with the answer is more important than the answer you come up with. And I did consulting work for 12 years before I started teaching, and I said, when I follow this approach, Sometimes my clients would say that's a good idea, and sometimes they would say, thanks for your time, I disagree with your conclusions. But they respected the method by which I came up with the answer. Yeah. But again, it's useful, but it's on a very, very narrow domain. And we kind of covered these things, like mm -hmm. what's a good source, what isn't, what's persuasive, what's not persuasive. Mm -hmm. But it's a very, very narrow, it's useful, but it's very narrow. But still, though, if they could go from that, I mean, you know, when we're talking about critical thinking, um, you know, which is one of the areas that I have a lot of interest in, if you can <coughs> use transfer for that, because there's teaching for transfer, so they've done that in your project, you know, is there, are there ways in which you could then say, um, like, this is how you take the skills that you've learned from this into something else? Because, you know, you always have to learn something through a fairly narrow opportunity. But then the question is, like, how do you scaffold out like the transfer piece for the critical thinking? Well, this so is that's anecdotal. really interesting. Um, I try to stay in touch with a number of students. I was in New York recently for a wedding, and a, a former student of mine works there. We met coffee, mm -hmm. and I didn't come up with this project, so I'm not taking credit for it. But she said one of the best things that I learned at AU was working on that project because yeah. she does consulting work for IBM, and she often has to you know, say, hey, I want you to come up with the answer, but it sounds like your boss has got the answer key. Right. All right, yeah. let's see how you get it. Two points yeah. up for that, you misspelled that. Right. Right. Number four, exactly. you're pretty close, I gave you 50%. And she talked about, again, that's an anecdote, but um, it's a really valuable skill mm -hmm. that if you can think on your own and you can make a persuasive argument, even if the person assesses that you're wrong, mm -hmm. but they respect the method, because you do that enough times, and you're going to get enough, I'm going to call them right answers. Yeah. You're going to get enough right answers to make it worth your while. Great. Yeah. So 
my um, course I teach in the master's level, the age of um, students is from mid twenties to sixties, and so there's there's this wide range of um, orientation, and um, it's it's a strong experiential based program. So the reading and the assigned reading sort of helps set the context, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, the hope is, the expectation is that they've done done the readings, and one of the first things we do is go through, you know, theories of theorists and uh, <coughs> the, like learning about semantic and knowledge about the individual and their body of work, mm -hmm. and make that relevant uh, to to some of the rest of the course. So we do experiential, we set context, and. Um, perspective is something that I use a lot to um, challenge if, if there seems to be someone's just locked onto one one um, method or one theory. Mm -hmm. So to shift perspectives and scenarios and um, case studies, we we have uh, student teams pair up with um, live internal OB people to listen, so developing their listening skills and being able to be reflective partners. And uh, and then do some research on where the organization is in their mm -hmm. process and what might make sense next, and then they, they feed it back to the individual and then to, mm -hmm. at the end of the last day of the class, that's what they do. So we have, and then they, and then they do their own papers. So there's mm -hmm. this, mix of experiential, team-based, um, applied learning, and, um, and it's through that last assignment in the paper where um, when, when they see Wikipedia cited, it's, it's, that's something that they know there's got to be other data. You know, mm -hmm. so, so we go through what's expected um, of a research editor. Um, so it's it's interesting hearing about the, the undergraduate level and actually shifting the knowledge and awareness and then having this range of where people are coming from to be able to influence. Yeah. So do you find um, that through doing this kind of mixed methods where you're doing all of this, do they seem to develop a critical approach to information through that or do you still see a fair amount where it's like you know like so I personally have a concern with telling people which it doesn't sound like you're doing like just just only use peer review because like I said that doesn't help them when they leave right and right. you know mm -hmm. yeah no and actually for their paper uh, to they need to have their paper reviewed by two of the cohort members mm -hmm. um, but the, the you know the sources cite them correctly and and more than like if, if it's an eight to ten page paper, then we expect at least six to eight mm -hmm. sites, and so so that's what we're looking for. We spend at least half hour and forty five minutes going through on that last day what this last assignment is about, and you know what questions, answering clarifying questions. Mm -hmm. um, it's a compressed schedule. Yeah. So that's, yeah. You know the team stuff they can do in between the two weekends. Right. And I don't know if, if um, I do an hour and a half with them at orientation. In um, in the in the site for you. Good to. So we have about five more minutes, um, you know. So if we have more, we can keep on talking. I did want to say uh, I want to be sure everyone got one of these and that we got emails, so I will clean these up a little bit. And I just wanted to share just randomly, uh, yeah. when you were mentioning about, uh, at the beginning, about the uh, possible negative effects on attention, right? Yes. Of all of this. So I just saw, I know if somebody was on a monitor, who was, I think, until recently, the New York Times uh, tech mm -hmm. uh, correspondent, who has, I just saw what I think is the first uh, op ed column, mm -hmm. I think, that moved over to being an op ed column. Okay. And it was actually it's sort of tongue in cheek, but it was talking about 
how um, they had just taken their first meditation class, which was required because they lived in Northern California. Mm -hmm. um, and both the difficulty of that, but also how important it was to sort of sit your mind and mm -hmm. be able to focus on certain things. And so I recommend that as possible future columns. Yeah, no, actually, it's kind of interesting. Tony Verona and I, um, on the Provost Council, when we were originally coming up with, like, what do we think university, ultimate le university learning-wide outcomes should be at what we want from our students? And both of us were like, we want our students to be able to sit silently in the presence of their own mind for 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, but I'm actually kind of serious right. about yeah. that. Yeah. It's, Wait, no, no, you're at the, you're at the law library. No, no, Tony Verona yeah. is. So oh, right, um, right. I'm in the I'm in the library, yeah. but uh, we we're both on the we were on the provost council together. Right. And so when we were having that discussion, but I actually, you know, um, one of the things that I'll just throw out that um, are some ideas I'm playing around with and like kind of doing that to Nancy and saying she's usually pretty supportive actually of like crazy ideas I come up with. But one of them that I really like to explore uh, based on some of the feedback that we get from students is that they don't know how to have conversations with each other. This is another thing that, you know, to me is very interesting because like for me, reflecting back on my own university days, what you learn in the classroom is important, but when you would be hanging out with your friends, having like the big discussions, that was like realistically about 70% of what was really transformative, right? It's like those deep conversations you get to have with your peers in these times that that one time of life in which you're not overwhelmed usually with as many external responsibilities. Um, but what we're finding from our students in some of the like student engagement survey is that they don't know how to have good conversations with each other. So there's this movement called the Socrates Cafe movement. And um, that's an idea, the Socrates Cafe movement is about, like, philosophy is not supposed to be about super erudite people who sit around and have read difficult, impossible things that maybe actually came out of a, a, a postmodern generation engine somewhere. That what it's really supposed to be about is exploring the world through conversation. And so I am planning on perhaps proposing that the library should begin hosting Socrates Cafe dinners, if I could get people to, you know, like I would do a couple of months. So, you know, but I think that that might be something just to give like some model for how to go about doing that in a more informal, not graded way. But I, I think that's another piece of it. It's like, you know, you got to be able to have conversations. You can see the old South Park episode about the kids all having it. No. You find you can find it on YouTube. It's yeah. Very funny. And the it's chef, the chef figures out that, that that's what they're all in really, and the way he figures it out is because they're also so doubt that they're excited that Phil Collins is going to come in with concerts. He's got this world of these kids, and then he finds out that they're all on on Italy. So yeah. then he organizes um, someone to come to town who has a way to cure kids of their attention disorder without the use of drugs. And basically, so, he's got, so he gives a presentation to parents at the school, and they have four of them are sitting in chairs and all doing this. And he's like, you know, you got all your kids are all on drugs, and it's not good for them. You know, you don't need to use drugs. And he said, this is how, how you do it. He doesn't really need to say, pay attention. He goes, sit down and shut up and pay attention. <laughs> and the kids are sitting doing this. And he did yeah. that to the second and the third one and the fourth one. He does it all by himself. But that's what he did. Well, I mean, I do think, you know, there is good indication that, like our, like I said, this ubiquitous continuous partial attention is, um, you know, so, and there's the other one where, like, there's certain places where they put their phones in these sealed things, like when you go to a concert or something, so that you can't get them. Yeah. yeah, you can't access them, and they're doing that in some schools now. But, I mean, you know, so part of the challenge really is these things are designed to be addictive. I mean, that is what they're designed to do. And they're just hacking a weakness that's in the human psyche. You know, I well, mean, now they're all, they're all talking into their phones and getting answers to questions. And there's that. But, but you know, I mean, I think... You see about the little boy asking Alexa. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 And then yeah. And the teachers are saying, yeah, the kids are like whispering into their phones and they get a quiz and they're whispering into their phones. But, 
clarify. But I think that, you know, so yeah, so I think there's a there's some interesting question there, but um, I think this is something for us to all be watching. Like, what does it really do to our attentions? And things of that nature. You know, the one thing I, I've, re I've often recommended to students before they're going to study abroad, because being quiet and observing mm -hmm. is important, but it's really hard for students. They, I mean, they've been telling me this for years that they just find it really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And so, from my own experience, I thought, you know, what they all should do is they should all take a drawing class, because then you get assignments. You have to go out with your with your sketchbook, and you just have to really sit there and look at something and observe in order to do it. So I'm just going to put down. There's various contemplative, contemplative practices, and yeah. you know, like drawing is one. Straight up meditation is another. So um, you're going to get them something to do with their hands. That's yeah, I would need that. That would not work for me. But I mean, I can't draw, and it just stresses well, me out. Yeah, but I, I took a but, class. And I can't draw, but it was a lot. Of yeah, things. no. I mean, I think that you're right, though. Something, various things. There are people that knit that way. Yeah. So there's a lot of different things, like ways to, but actually having incorporations of something where they're doing um, knitting or whatever, um, but something that gives you that still. Yeah, time. but they're not read, and they're not reading. Yeah. They're, also, Dean Wilkins does a book club. Yeah. With her students, mm -hmm. totally optional. But and, and I think it's an interesting learning outcome, unintended maybe, about illustrating the value of long form work. Right. Like the dean reads books. Mm -hmm. I should too. And she'll talk to me about them if I read them too. Um, but she also does a podcast club. Yeah. So if you don't, you know, if you don't have time to read. A whole book, like we're all going to listen to the same episode of the same podcast and have a conversation. So I think those are sort of informal yeah. practices, and I like just sort of where the, the symbol of where they come from, right? right. The idea of like somebody is able to to sort yeah. of connect with students, and it, it it really to me reminds me of the Socrates Cafe idea. Yeah. It's like we're just going to have conversations yep. around a set of ideas. It's not graded. But it requires you to pay attention to something for a little bit of time. Just don't call it Socrates Cafe. Yeah. Nobody will come. Call it free dinner or conversation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be things that we can do, but yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so we are. So, we are, by the way, at time, which we can continue talking, but I also want to be sure that people can leave if they need to. So, thank you so much for spending some time with me.